Um, my name is Derek Weber, uh, Spaceport Associates, and uh, we're here to talk about uh, a session on space tourism, one of many sessions on space tourism at, at this conference. And uh, the, the good news for me is that there are so many sessions about it, because only a few years ago there weren't any. Uh, and it's become so accepted that uh, some of our speakers today are actually running space tourism businesses very successfully. Others are planning for them to, to get started. And this is very much now a tried and tested new business. The only thing we don't know about it is, you know, how big is it? We know it exists. <clears throat> um, we, I haven't quite decided how to, how to do this depending on how many people turn up. So what I'll do initially is have each individual speaker do their presentation. We'll take a few questions and we'll see how the time's going and then we'll move on. And then there might be time at the end for a panel session as well, but that's how we'll do it. So I'll introduce each speaker in turn rather than bore you at the beginning. So our first speaker is Alan Ladwig. And just to show that we're always bang up the date at this conference, uh, in um, today's NASA Watch, it tells us the latest news about Alan Ladwig, and he's yet another reincarnation of, of this, 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 this dynamo of a man who... Uh, <laughs> uh, he's currently manager of Washington Operations Northrop Grumman, but he has a vast experience of entrepreneurial work in, in the space tourism industry, which, some of which he's going to share with us today. And uh, he was also, prior to that, um, so he's been inside the house at NASA as well. So he knows he knows every perspective. Here. So let's let's start with Alan Ladwig. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Usually at these science fiction conferences, Doctor Who conferences, people are wearing uniforms. I was disappointed that nobody had a uniform here on, so I brought mine. Um, this is my uniform from Zero Gravity, which Tim will be telling you about. But I still am affiliated with the company and still hope to fly with them some more in the future. But I also wore it to demonstrate and to remind everybody that space tourism is real, space tourism has started, and if a policy geek like me can be involved and actually up there flying, so can you. Uh, this session that you're about to hear is uh, about your dream to fly in space. Uh, some of you would settle for a suborbital flight, others of you are ready to fill out a permanent change of address card and uh, get a, 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 a townhouse at lunar landings or maybe a condo on the Mars. And you're very fond of that, that phrase, multi-planet species. You can't wait for that. Well, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a historical overview just to remind us how long people have been trying to get involved with space tourism and all the people that have tried to do it and some of the people that have, uh, you'll hear have aspirations from 50 years ago or similar to what we've been doing today. We've, for centuries, we've dreamed about flapping our way into orbit. In recent times, we've been urged by the writers, politicians, NASA people, aerospace executives, journalists, and those in the know that your ticket to ride was just a uh, rocket away and that soon you'd all be flying. Uh, we believe the trek into orbit will fulfill a yearning spiritual quest to add meaning to our otherwise meaningless lives. Achieving the challenge of star travel will extract a new level of excellence and unearth our true potential. We hear that those who have been there and back are blessed with an overview effect where memories of national borders give way to respect for all earthly brothers. But does the dream of flight for ordinary people really warrant so much optimism? Shouldn't we all be there by now? Uh, whatever gave us the idea that space travel would become so routine and that large numbers of us would go that we could make the bold salutation, see you in orbit. Uh, the, the story begins with the dreams of Dr. Robert Goddard. Uh, and you all know him as the father of American rocketry. His first successful launch of a liquid propellant rocket in 1926. His prime interest was using rocketry as a tool for atmospheric investigations. However, in 1919, in a monograph titled A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes, he speculated that someday it would be possible to have a spacecraft go to the moon. This amused a lot of his peers and the press. The New York, the press started calling him the Moon Man, and that was not as a compliment. The New York Times went so far as to say he didn't have the knowledge laid out daily in a high school uh, physics class. But while the press and his peers were skeptical, the public 
really jumped on to this journey. Uh, just as citizens today write to NASA, and when I was the head of the Space Flight Participant Program in the mid-80s, I would get thousands of letters from people wanting to fly in the shuttle, people started writing to Robert Goddard. He received more than 100 letters from volunteers that wanted to fly on his yet-to-be-built moon rocket. Professor C. Bukia of the International Literary Musical Institute of Baltimore offered himself, quote, to science, willing to be a passenger at the time the projectile will be per perfected. A Hollywood publicity agent thought that Goddard's torpedo rocket ought to carry a greeting from his client, the actress Mary Pickford. G.E. Maxwell of New Mexico said he'd be glad to fly, provided his name was withheld from the public and his expenses were paid from, this, uh, from his hometown. Some of the mail intended for Robert Goddard ended up in the hands of other people who shared his last name. A letter from France found its way to the offices of Perils of Pauline author Charles Goddard in New York City. Charles forwarded the letter to Harold Goddard of Swarthmore College and added a postscript, by the way, what's become of that rocket project? I'm sure there are a great many people who would be glad to contribute a dollar or two as a sporting event to see how far it would go. I suggest that you send as a passenger Senator Royal Copeland, who would love the publicity, the sovereign state of New York would be willing to let you have it. <laughs> From South Swarthmore College, Harold Goddard redirected the letter to the appropriate Professor Goddard, and in his forwarding correspondence noted the uh, previous suggestion about Senator Copeland, and then added, if you can spare the space in your rocket, your ship, you should ship the entire Senate to the moon. At any rate, squeeze in Henry Cabot Lodge. The Portsmouth Star pointed out that Goddard's rocket wasn't a new idea at all, in a front-page story titled Rub-a-Dub-Dub, -Dub, Three Men in a Rocket Will Try to Reach the Moon, they reminded readers that this is an idea that hundreds of learned men have had for opening social, commercial, and tennis relations with the folk on the moon. Alas, all those who volunteered to fly with Goddard didn't get anywhere. The acting secretary of the Smithsonian, who was a sponsor of Goddard, uh, had to write a form letter of rejection, just like the form letter of rejection I used to have to send to people. And his said, there is no possibility that any volunteers will be called for a trip to the moon, either in your lifetime or mine. But should there, uh, should there be, we will bear your offer in mind. Goddard, in the meantime, was really more irritated than pleased with all this uh, interest. He said, I wish to say that I have asked for no volunteers. There is at this moment no rocket ship contemplated for the moon. If there were less volunteering and more financial support, I could get along much faster. The jet setters of the day were especially interested in this field of rocketry. In her gossip column in the October 1930 issue of the Metro World Traveler, Lady Drummond Hay reported on the space dreams of the rich and famous. After the German Rocket Society for Space Travel, brought their work to her attention. The society recommended that she should try to interest a newspaper group in rocket flights to the moon and probably Mars later on. In her, co in her gossip column, Lady Hay reported that one of her favorite celebrities, the Infante Don Alfonso, cousin of the King of Spain and head of Spanish Air Service, was captivated by the dream of space travel. During a South American tour aboard the Grand Zeppelin, Alonso and Colonel Emilio Herrera incessantly discussed rocket transports and the possibilities of everyday feasible, uh, as an everyday feasible proposition. Then we, we go fast forward to the fall of 1950, where officials from the Hayden Planetarium in New York City recognized that you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be interested in space travel. They decided to add a little bit of realism to a lecture that Ger the German author Willie Ley was giving on conquest of space. So out in the lobby in front of the lecture hall, they set up an interplanetary tour reservation booth and handed out application forms. The form said, you are the first to request a reservation on a space tour. And the applicants were supposed to check where they want to go, the moon, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. And then they were supposed to consult the safety manual for complete takeoff procedures, including anti-blast protection and care for, of personal equipment. The estimated departure date to the moon for the spaceship Lunaria, 1975. Numerous newspapers and magazines around the world carried the story of this form and asked if they could re 
uh, printed in their publications. So all of a sudden, mail by the sack load started arriving at the Hayden Planetarium. They gave their consent to all these people to duplicate it, and what had begun as kind of a tongue-in-cheek promotional gimmick turned into a, a, a marketing program beyond their wildest imaginations. It was no stunt to the 26,000 applicants who wrote to the museum over the next two years. Uh, initially, the head of guest relations responded individually to the request. It got too much for him. He had to have a form letter. But with the letter, they sent out a packet of uh, information, including a list of space societies, a recommended reading list, and sources for picture slides and references materials. The packet also include a wallet-sized reservation certificate of the Hayden Planetarium Space Travel Tours Interplanetary Route. One side had the Hayden's famous uh, Zeiss Planetarium projector superimposed over a winged rocket ship, and the reverse had a time schedule of how long it would take to go to each of the planets. When I was the head of Space Flight Participant Program in the 80s, people used to send me copies of those cards and ask if they could turn it in for a ride. Believing that the spaceship Lunaria was on the pad and ready for takeoff, Elsie Sherwood of Westwood, Massachusetts uh, sent in a dollar bill with her reservation. I'm a female of about 60, therefore expendable. I have been around the world three times and will gladly go further. Frank Forrester, the guest relations guy, returned the dollar, said, according to estimate, almost four billion of these dollars will be needed to start research. This astronomical figure is one for governments to worry about, not you and me. Uh, years later, the whole gimmick didn't seem so interesting or poignant anymore. Knee-deep in applications and overwhelmed by the mailing expense, the Hayden quietly killed off their promotion. A new supervisor for guest relations, James Pickering, uh, his letters were not as cheery as his predecessors. In one letter, uh, Pickering confessed that the whole thing had been an elaborate promotional stunt under the previous administration. He complained that the idea exploded and became a nuisance. We have not had anything to do with it now for some time, and he begged a journalist who wanted to do a follow-up story in 1961, we will be grateful if you avoid any mention of it. Now we fast forward a few more years, 1957. Two Sputniks are overhead, and Werner von Braun, the founder of the National Space Society, is featured on the night, November 18, 1957 issue of Life magazine. He was referred to as the seer of space. And in the article, they said if we'd have listened to him and what he wanted to do with rocketry, uh, and if we listen to what the Russians were up to, instead of dismiss, uh, we'd be farther ahead, and, and ins instead of dismissing his remarks, as if they were made by a tiresome crackpot. The following week, he spoke at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, where he outlined the next 100 years for a symposium sponsored by Seagram's. He reassured the audience that the Soviets were not about to monopolize the moon, things would evolve along the lines of the Ar Antarctica, and that by the year 2057, he thought there would be lunar suites and gambling joints on the moon where you could have a cozy honeymoon. The hotels would be operated by several national space lines for the purpose of attracting more passenger traffic in addition to their business of hauling commercial cargo. Somebody go tell uh, uh, Mr. Musk that he's got another thing to do. <laughs> Judging from the letters that began to arrive at NASA, uh, oh, I think I skipped one thing. Oh, so then uh, we start for a search for astronauts in 1959, and there was a lot of uh, commotion at NASA about who would, it, who would they go to to find astronauts. And they were looking at different criteria. And then finally, President Eisenhower said, we're going to use military test pilots. And as one NASA person say, this, said, this rules out matadors, race car drivers, mountain climbers, and soldiers of fortune. So once the astronauts were announced in 1959, they were described as premium individuals picked for an unconventional task the best of a very good lot, a bright, balanced, splendidly conditioned first team, willing, eager, in fact, to undertake an assignment that most men would think unthinkable. Well, it wasn't unthinkable to all the people that started writing to NASA, asking and volunteering to fly. Even though the Mercury qualifications ruled out all but military test pilots, the public still clamored for a chance to participate. In his cover story, What's It Like to Fly in Space, 
and this is from this issue of Life magazine in April 1959, uh, Warren Young cataloged the reasons most people fly or aspire to fly in space. Some of them see the trip as a form of escape, either as a psychological escape from humanity or a simple old-fashioned escape from woman trouble. Some are thrill seekers who think that a ride in space would merely be an exceptionally cool hot rod drag. Some are ridden by guilt complexes, either justified or imagined, and think volunteering will bring atonement. And I remind you on this uh, photo of him in the, uh, this was a, a Convair aircraft where he got to do the parabolic flight. It only took us at zero gravity about uh, 40 years later to make this uh, a reality for you and me. Young's article was based on his experience as a journalistic observer, and he had this unique behind the scenes to get jerked, jolted, roasted, frozen, and spun in the same test that had been designed for the Mercury astronaut selection. Two decades later, journalists would use these, uh, cite these examples of observer merit badge as proof that they deserve to be the first uh, private citizens to scout out orbit. In 1960, the 11th IAF Congress was underway in Stockholm. Now up to this point, no living creature had successfully been launched and retrieved from orbit. A trio of engineers from the Douglas Aircraft Company, however, told the delegates that space travel could be, uh, become quite inexpensive. In a presentation titled Direct Operating Costs of a Class of Nuclear Spaceships, Max Hunter and his fellow Douglas engineers offered an economical alternative to chemical rockets that were then in use. They concluded that nuclear vehicles have been found to present near-term capability for the exploration and possible exploitation, exploitation of the moon in nearby planets based on achievable, achievability of cargo carrying direct costs on the order of $1 a pound. Personal transport, the audience would sold, may be achieved on similar missions at a cost of 500 to 5,000 per pound for a round trip lunar and one way Martian miss mission, respectively. Time Magazine introduced a story on Hunter's ideas with the nursery rhyme Sing song, merry go round, here we go off to the moon oak. The article didn't specify when, but left the impression that it wouldn't be long before commercial space travelers would be able to suit up and fly right. Cost of a round trip ticket to the moon, the article concluded, would be $900, about $40 less than the current first class jet fare from New York to Paris and back. <laughs> Where did we go wrong? Uh, a few months after uh, the Stockholm meeting, Von Braun indicated that Hunter's ideas weren't far off the mark. By this time, Von Braun had become the director of the uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, and in a Space World Magazine article titled, What I Believe, he predicted it is entirely conceivable that within our lifetimes that rocket ships will be transporting people to vacations in space and that some of the famous European spas will be competing with new spas on Venus. Talk about a hot facial. <laughs> Throughout 1964, as NASA caught its breath between Mercury and preparations for Gemini, a journalist named Gerhard Pister uh, strolled into a travel agency in Venice and asked to book a flight on uh, the next flight to the moon. The agent accepted a deposit of $20 and forwarded Pister's request to Pan Am Airways and to Russia's national airline, Aeroflot. As a journalist, Pister knew a good story when he saw one. I'm naturally interested in space flight, he said, and going to the moon as a newsman is a good story if I was first. Uh, Pister wasn't the only one who knew a good story when he saw one. Pan Am eagerly embraced the idea and the request. They told him, they responded, said to expect the first flight in the year 2000. And uh, as the story spread, they, um, they decided to uh, book him into a moon flight club and gave him an enrollment card with a, a membership card that documented his rank in the queue. Aeroflot, on the other hand, thought that he must have been joking, sent a flippant response that said, sorry, but our first flight is already sold out. Maybe he should try for the second flight, and while you're at it, why don't you try to book a room in the hotel crater? Well, this whole Pan Am thing grew and grew over the years. I'll make another reference to it, but it ended up in the late uh, 70s, I think it was, uh, with 93,000 names on it. And people, again, along those Hayden cards, I used to get the Pan Am Moon Flight Club cards regularly sent to me and said, let me cash this in. 
But, you know, when you think about it, he had the right idea of going to a travel agency to book the reservation. He assumed that it'd be most likely to be commercial airlines, not the government agencies, that would provide transportation to make his dream come true. Morris Fergish, the president of the U.S. Freight Company, affirmed this assumption when he spoke at a conference in Frankfurt on the theme transportation in the year 2000. He told the audience, transportation is the servant of the people, the genie which makes the dreams come true, the magic carpet of the future, the mobility of their dreams, their aspirations, and their resources. And all that for a deposit of $20. In 65, Alexei Lenov stepped out of Vostok 2 to uh, capture another record with the first spacewalk. And his spacewalk demonstrated that the U.S. had a ways to go to catch up in the moon race. So the contractors and NASA started getting worried that because we weren't winning the race at that time, that maybe the public and Congress would start to pull out. And there were already congressmen who were questioning the sanctity of Kennedy's time schedule to get to the moon within a decade. So with that concern, the Martin Company, the predecessor of Martin Marietta, uh, builder of the Titan rocket, submitted an unsolicited proposal to NASA headquarters with a whole lot of ideas about public support. One of the suggestions carried the banner National Geographic Society Space Expedition and said that what they should do is put a National Geographic photojournalist on one of the Gemini missions. Now you can imagine how the Gemini astronauts would have loved that. But they thought it would strengthen public relations between the program and the people whose taxes make it possible. Mind you, at this point, NASA had only conducted eight manned missions. Despite the limited experience, the Martin engineers believed that a journalist on a flight would demonstrate to the world that U.S. spaceflight technology and equipment had become so good that passenger flights are now practical for persons with no special physical or technical training. Yeah. The proposal was so bold as to take a shot at the astronauts for being uh, astronauts. It said public interest and identification with space would be stimulated to a much greater degree uh, if the passenger would be more like the public and not like a highly trained astronaut. People would feel they were getting the straight, unvarnished story and could be made to feel that they are getting more direct personal benefit for their money. Uh, evidently, the, the personal stories of the astronauts from the Life magazines at that time were a little too varnished for everybody. In the fall of '65, uh, Professor Walter or Dr. Walter D uh, Dornberger, who was from the Pena Monday alumni, uh, was on the eve of his retirement from Bell Aerospace. Uh, the former German general said that the problems with launching on the big one-way boosters and the economy of space exploration was all wrong. He said that we had to have a different approach, not spend billions and millions on uh, launching from pads, and that we had to take off from a runway. And what is to be proved to be a most painful, accurate prophecy, he concluded, after we've gone to the moon, we'll have to start over again. Project Apollo cannot be turned back, but the next time we must create an environment in space that can be used by men, not only for research, but also for commerce. In his judgment, the environment could be created with the construction of a space station, a resupplied space shuttle. If we had invested only a small part of our energies and funds on, uh, that had been expended on ballistic booster development and instead put it on space planes and tr space transporters, we would not be heading down one of the most expensive dead ends, uh, which, and we would be much better prepared for the future. Now, just uh, four months after the Apollo fire, in the mid-60s, Kraft Ericke, another Penamunde alum, reminded his fellow members of the American Astronautical Society that the lure of space went beyond technical disciplines. And he spoke on a panel on space tourism, and uh, he said that the space program had a deeper purpose than to watch astronauts in orbit. As time goes on, we will be perceived ever more clearly that we are not only children of Earth, but of the entire universe, who has a magic appeal to those who can hear their voice challenging us to fly high. Incidentally, on that same panel was the uh, hotel uh, magnet uh, Baron Von Hilton. And he said uh, where there's, if, if there are going to be people in space, there needed to be Hiltons. He envisioned a resort complex with 100 guest rooms, nuclear-powered kitchens, freeze-dried dining, wall-to-wall -wall televisions, ceiling-high windows overlooking Earth, and of course, a cocktail lounge. 
As Hilton pointed out, if you think you're not going to have a cocktail lounge, you don't know Hilton. It, enter the Galaxy Lounge. Enjoy a martini, see the stars. And I think we should now try to get Paris Hilton because she's so visible everywhere involved in this movement. Uh, he was only, even willing to let somebody else's name be on the guest halls, and his idea was to uh, have a partnership with the Douglas Aircraft Factory and franchise the Hilton name and know-how to set up a chain of Hilton Douglas Orbiter Hotels. Uh, I'm going to run out of time here, so let me skip uh, forward a little bit. And then we get into the age of the space shuttle. And when the space shuttle was coming out, again, we heard from everybody that, boy, this is our ticket to ride. The, the, all of us it wouldn't just be astronauts that were going to get to fly. It'd get to be us normal folks as well. It would usher in a day when, uh, when there would be astronauts as numerous as commercial jet pilots. Flights into space would take off daily, and virtually any young man and, uh, who yearns to voyage into space will be able to do so at some point in their life. When Nixon approved the space transportation system, George Lowe noted that one of the things Nixon liked about it was that you could um, fly normal people on it. And he thought that that was a good thing, that it wasn't just for astronauts, it'd be for everybody. Uh, then Lowe got into a thing where he thought for the orbiting test flight, they needed to do something to jazz it up a bit and get public interest going. So he recommended to a, a NASA study group that they fly Philippe Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau's son, and have him work the magic in space just like they had on Earth. As a secondary idea, it said if, if Philippe can't do it, maybe send Walter Cronkite, who, uh, those of you that uh, may be too young to know it, but Cronkite was like the voice of space during the Apollo program. So at this juncture, while the shuttle was being developed in the mid-70s, there were several studies done at NASA. The Office of Space Flight building the space shuttle went down one path with something they called a unique personality. And under that plan, they wanted to fly artists, poets, teachers, uh, politicians, ambassadors. They really wanted to open it up. Meantime, another path was being taken by the Public Affairs Office, and they just were interested in flying journalists. Uh, and so there got to be a big fight for a while, and then with all the delays that were going on uh, with the development, it really didn't matter, and that got put on hold. But with the uh, theme music blasting from the Star Trek uh, TV show in 1976, they rolled out the Space Shuttle Enterprise. Senator Barry Goldwater assured the spectators that it was probably the best investment the U.S. Congress ever made, and James Fletcher, the administrator, promised the crowd that this day we enter a new era, the evolution uh, into the age of man in space, not just astronauts and cosmonauts, but medial beings willing to leave their planet for brief and extended periods of time. Making the case for we medial types was somebody you're going to hear from this afternoon, Tom Rogers. He was a member of NASA's uh, Space Programs Advisory Council. The week after the debut of the Enterprise, he wrote to Dr. Fletcher, concerning the proper contemporary and continuing role of human beings in space. To Tom, it seemed ironic, by the time we reach uh, in point where people can venture into space with confidence, space activities will continue to be and perceived to be the province of technicians. As chairman of the Advisory Council's Applications Committee, Tom believed that the most fundamental role of humans in space was simply being there. To be there and not only as scientists, engineers, and pilots, but as curious, impressionable, creative individuals who can incorporate the essence of the flight experience into their lives and careers on Earth. To accomplish this, uh, Tom felt that consideration should be given to allowing individuals schooled and practiced in arts and humanities and cultural and political leaders to visit space for short periods of time. And this included philosophers, poets, lawyers, theologians, writers, composers, dancers, historians, and Tom's list went on and on. It took a while, he didn't hear back, he wrote him again because as I've learned with Tom, you answer his mail or you will continue to talk to him about it. And he came back again to Fletcher and finally, Fletcher wrote him back and, and agreed with what Tom was saying, made reference to this unique personality study group and um, asked Tom to help in germinating this idea. Even Tim Leary, the high priest of LSD, was, became an advocate for human space exploration he thought it would be a, a good way to get world peace, to have everybody fly in space. 
and he predicted that it, uh, it would cost less to build on three or four acres in space than a three-bedroom house in Washington, D.C. Uh, when somebody asked him when would this uh, actually happen, uh, he said uh, space migration will become a reality ten years after people stop, stop laughing about it. Um, well, I'm running out of my time here, so I'm going to really cut to the uh, abbreviated chase, which is uh, how we got then to the Space Flight Participant Program. Once the first two shuttles went up uh, in, in 1981 and 80, in the 82 time frame, Jim Beggs was being besieged again with public mail, people wanting to go, and all kinds of celebrities and VIPs thought they should get to go first, so they were coming and bugging them. And he said, you know, we are without a process to, to figure out how to do this. He assigned a committee led by Dr. John Noggle, a former NASA engineer. Noggle set up a study. They, uh, they worked for about a year looking at would it be desirable to put somebody on the space shuttle as a, a non-astronaut. Uh, and, and one thing, I just have to give you this one uh, note that I, I think is appropriate because I think his daughter is here. Uh, the committee went out and, and asked uh, learned individuals if this was the right thing to do. And one of my favorite responses was from Professor Freeman Dyson. He thought that the objective of citizen flight ought to be to have fun. The primary pur purpose should be for public education and entertainment. He thought the ideal passenger would be Charlie Chaplin or Woody Allen. Somebody who could convey a sense of greatness of space indirectly by focusing upon human absurdities. Above all, pomposity and sol solemnity are to be avoided. A good clown is what you need. Uh, that idea didn't get very far. So then there were ideas about lotteries and that NASA didn't want to do lotteries. And finally, they dis the, this committee came out with its report. They said yes, in fact, and this was only after the fourth shuttle flight. They said yes, it is appropriate to start thinking about non-astronauts on shuttle flights. They set up an internal committee called Citizens in Space, which then evolved into the Space Flight Participant Program. I was uh, assigned to become the manager of that program. The first category was for teachers, uh, which enraged the journalists because they thought they should get to be first. The second uh, activity was going to be for journalists. And at the time of the Challenger accident, we were working on um, uh, the idea of maybe trying to figure out how to fly artists. So the, uh, you all know the story from there. Krista McCall became the first teacher in space. Uh, sadly, we lost her in the accident. But that the notion of an educator has lived on. We fought hard over the next 15 years to make sure that they didn't forget about Barbara Morgan, the uh, backup teacher in space candidate. She eventually became a regular astronaut. And that, in turn, led to a new program at NASA called the Educator Astronaut Program, where now, uh, teachers can apply to be astronauts. And I believe on the latest astronaut selection, three of the astronauts were from the Educator Astronaut Program. So I feel very proud that that notion of flying a teacher has uh, remained steady. And while we could not uh, expand the program enough to fly a lot of people in space, this is how we got to where we are today. And now you're going to hear from my colleagues who are going to tell you a little bit about what opportunities you have. I also remind you, there is opportunity to start to help this industry grow. Put your money where your mouth is, go buy a ticket with zero G. See you in orbit. Thank you.